First John chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Now, the title of this morning's message is The Coming of Antichrist. The Coming of Antichrist. We just read how the Apostle John, the same man who wrote the book of Revelation, this same man here warns of the spirit of Antichrist, which is already in the world, he says. But there is coming a day when there will be a specific individual, the Antichrist, who is empowered by Satan himself. Now turn to the book of Revelation chapter 13. Uh, it's funny how it worked. I really just realized uh, that we had that for the scripture reading here this morning. I didn't line it up that way, although it would have made sense if I did. So we're going to read uh, chapter 13, 1 through 8 in just a, a moment. But this man is known by many names. The little horn, the willful king, the man of sin, the son of perdition. And here in Revelation 13, he is referred to as the beast. How would you like to have your, your name or nickname be the beast? You know, if you're a football player, it'd probably work. But other than that, you probably don't want it. This is the beast who seeks to conquer the whole world. The beast who demands to be worshipped. The beast who makes war with the saints. Again, Revelation 13, 1 through 8. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. I want you to remember that part. 42 months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So this beast, this Man, Antichrist, is very, very powerful. And we will see that there is basically uh, what looks like a confederation of ten nations that give him his political power. But make no mistake, his true power comes from Satan. That is the devil, the dragon, as he is referred to in Revelation. Now, one of the beast's heads, the Bible says, was mortally wounded. And you've probably heard this before, uh, how there is this mortal wound and yet he lives on. That tells us a few things. Number one, it tells us that the beast both refers to the empire and the man who heads up that empire. And number two, it shows us that the beast or the antichrist, what he does is he imitates the true Christ with this staged resurrection event, for it says his mortal wound was healed. Now, in Revelation chapter 17, it says that those who dwell on the earth will marvel, okay? They will marvel. They will be in wonder when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Well, what does that mean? Well, they will be convinced that this man is immortal 
and unstoppable. They will believe that he was alive, he died, and yet he lives on. He was and is not, and yet is. Who can make war with the beast? He's immortal. He's unstoppable. Nobody can defeat him. And in their wonder, the people of this earth will worship him as God. He does this by copying the ministry of Jesus with this false resurrection. And notice how long the beast or the Antichrist is given to rule. What did we say it was? What did I say to remember? How long? 42 months or three and a half years. Now, how long did Jesus' ministry last? Three and a half years. No coincidence. You see, the fact is the world, especially apostate Christianity, they will believe that the Antichrist is Jesus. That's what they're going to believe. Or maybe some will believe, or they'll totally reject the idea that Jesus even came in the flesh, or that the Christ even came the first time, and they will accept the beast as the savior of mankind. That's how he will appear, at least at first. Now, apostate Christianity, which has really already rejected the true Christ, will accept this satanic counterfeit. See, to them, Satan is God, and God is Satan. Evil is good, and good is evil. Have you ever looked around the world around us today or even uh, Christendom? Have you ever looked around uh, in churches today and, and what's going on in the Christian world, quote unquote, and sometimes you, you just scratch your head and you say, man, things have really changed. You know, things are crazy. You look around the world, things are just crazy. All these things going on around us. Well, I got bad news for you, okay? It's only going to get worse. <laughs> That's all I can say. It's going to get worse before it gets better. I wish I could tell you otherwise. Now, maybe in our lifetime, potentially things could get better. But at the end of days, whenever this happens, things will get worse. Um, and really, you know, you think about it. It's not a matter of being crazy. That, that's really not what it is. There are people in power throughout the world they know what the Bible teaches. They know what Christianity teaches. They're just bent on doing the exact opposite. I think they understand, to some extent, uh, what they are doing. And many people simply just follow along. Those who do not follow along when all these things come to pass, this Antichrist agenda will be forced upon them. Now, what does the term Antichrist mean? What does it mean? I think most people would say, well, you know, anti-Christ means against Christ. And that's true to a certain extent. Uh, obviously, the anti-Christ is against the true Christ. That, that sort of goes without saying. Uh, but the term anti-Christ also means, what it really means is he is an imitation of Christ. He is a false Christ, one who stands in the place of Christ. Uh, claiming to be God in human flesh. Now, Revelation 13.4 says that the people of the world will worship the dragon. Okay, the dragon. Now, we know who the dragon is, right? Uh, the dragon is Satan or the devil. And it says they will blaspheme God, his tabernacle, and those who d dwell in heaven. Excuse me. Uh, the unbelieving world, or the people of this world, they will curse God. That's what they're going to do. Uh, they will curse God. They will curse God's people who already dwell in heaven. Many of God's people already are dwelling in heaven at this very moment. Uh, but for those who are on the earth who believe during this time known as uh, the Great Tribulation, there will be believers on the earth during this time. It says in verse 7 of Revelation 13, it was granted to him, that is the beast, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. That is the whole world. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, sometimes when people hear uh, the Bible preached, they will 
ask, and they will ask questions like, well, what does this have to do with me? How is this relevant to my life or to the life of others in the world today? Well, I think the answer is, is pretty obvious. Uh, the, the Bible says we are to watch. We are to be ready because we don't know when these things are going to happen. It is very possible that this could happen in our lifetime. If it does, it'll come upon unbelievers, the Bible says, like a thief in the night. They will not be prepared. And that's why a message like this really needs to be preached to warn people. Now, when it comes to believers, I think you know this, uh, many evangelical Christians hold to the uh, belief of what is called a pre-tribulational rapture. Okay, and that is the idea that all born again Christians will be taken to heaven before this tribulation begins. Uh, now, for those of you, or those of us who believe in this, uh, we're at least aware that there are other positions. Okay, there are those who believe in a mid trib rapture, there's people who believe in a post trib rapture, there's the partial rapture theory, where there are multiple rap uh, raptures all throughout the tribulation. Um, some don't believe in any rapture at all. Uh, but uh, the pre-trib rapture, if that is correct, basically my point is this. If that's true, we really don't have anything to worry about as far as if this happens in a lifetime, we're not going to be here. So, you know, you can just sort of sit back and breathe a, a sigh of relief. Uh, however, the, the potential danger there, and by the way, I, I really hope that's true, okay? Because if this happens in our lifetime, I don't want to be around during the Great Tribulation. So I really really, really hope that that is true. But if it isn't, and I think we at least have to entertain the possibility, and some of you say, well, it's a very small possibility. Okay, that's fine. But what if, okay, what if? The danger there is that if the Antichrist comes, if he rises to power, uh, some people will be caught off guard if that takes place. What am I saying? Basically, if that scenario comes to pass, a lot of people would say, well, he sure looks like the Antichrist. That sure looks like the mark of the beast, but it can't be because we're still here. So I think we at least need to be aware that that is a potential danger if indeed that position is wrong. And other people say, well, it's not wrong, so don't have to worry about it. Okay. Now, I personally find it hard to be dogmatic on some of these positions. End times Bible prophecy is one of the most difficult subjects in the Bible to interpret. But I would simply say this. We need to stay awake. We need to watch. We need to stay in the fold. What is more important than anyone's rapture position is that we remain faithful. Amen. That's what's most important. And I've told you this story a couple of years ago. I preached on the second coming. Uh, I guess it was <clears throat> maybe two years ago, three years ago, maybe by now. And on the way out the door, uh, a, a visitor said to me, she said, I believe Jesus is already among us. I said, well, what do you, what do you mean? <laughs> is it, was he here in the service? Was he said, she said, no, I believe Jesus was already among us. Uh, or he is already among us, and one day he's just going to reveal himself and say, here I am. I was living among you the whole time. Uh, you know, and she seemed totally serious. Now, she obviously wasn't listening to the sermon, okay? Either that or she just didn't believe it, but uh, what I found troubling about that statement is that's not how Jesus comes. The Bible says he comes in the clouds with great power and glory. That's not how Jesus comes that's how the Antichrist comes, okay? He will rise up among men. And I believe it is very, very possible that many professing Christians, and I think that illustration is proof that many professing Christians will accept the Antichrist. They will believe that he is Jesus. And that's sad. It is. It's sad to think about that. So how will he rise to power and what will he be like? Now turn to Revelation chapter six, uh, if you would. As you're turning there, the book of Daniel describes empires as beasts. 
And there is an empire that is to come that many commentators call the revived Roman Empire. How many have heard? The, yes, of course, we've all heard of this, the revived Roman Empire. You know, others, and this is becoming more and more a popular view, I don't really like it personally, but some will point to the United States. The United States is this world empire. You know, you got the people on the town common, stop U.S. imperialism. I don't think they believe what the Bible is saying about all this, but that's sort of the idea. People look at the United States as that power. Some people look at the United Nations as that power. Some look to the European Union, and there is some debate on who this will be or who is the Roman or revived Roman Empire. Uh, the Bible does talk about Babylon or mystery Babylon. And Babylon refers to the political and economic system, all right? And mystery Babylon, the false religious system, which I would point out, uh, Revelation 17 says, is seated on seven hills. And Rome historically has been known as the city on seven hills. But my personal view, before we read Revelation chapter 6, my personal view on Babylon, really, I guess you call it speculation, uh, it seems that we are headed towards a one world government. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next year, but that seems to be where we are headed. And I believe if this does happen in our lifetime, which is an if, the United Nations would most likely be used as the platform to usher in the one world government. It doesn't really seem that it could happen any other way, but we really don't know. Okay, the United States... Uh, we know that the United Nations is primarily funded by the United States. This is what people would say to argue this point. Uh, the United Nations is located in the United States. We are the driving force behind it. But I see too many things in the Bible that point to uh, Europe or Rome. So if it does happen, people always ask, what about the United States? Is the United States in Bible prophecy? And I think the answer is, is no. So if it were to happen soon, uh, it would look like that the United States would either be neutralized or we could remain neutral. We could choose to remain neutral. But again, these things are uh, speculation. So uh, let's look at Revelation chapter 6, starting in verse 1. And I believe this demonstrates that the rise of Antichrist will at first, all right, at first be relatively uh, peaceful. Revelation 6 one and two. Now, when I saw the lamb open one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see. And I looked and behold, a white horse and he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. Now, you notice it's Jesus opening the seals. It's not Jesus on the horse. It's Jesus opening the seal. So remember, God is in control over these events, for they serve to accomplish his will in judging the earth. So it is the Antichrist, we believe, who is seated on the white horse. At first, he looks good. You know, the rider on the white horse, he's coming in to solve all the problems. That's the way it looks. A knight in shining armor, that's the way sometimes it, it's pictured. So he comes in to fix the world's problems, perhaps, but his true nature, uh, that's going to be revealed a little later on. Uh, notice that he has a bow, but there is no mention of any arrows. Uh, and the crown, it says, was given to him. He didn't take it. It was given to him. So I think these things together indicate that his conquest will be a relatively peaceful conquest. Uh, at worst, perhaps a, a bloodless coup. We don't, we don't know for certain. Again, it's hard to be dogmatic on some of these things. So we don't have time to get into all these uh, verses, but apparently uh, what happens is there is a confederation of nations uh, that he is a part of and by which he will gain power. Now, the book of Daniel uh, pictures the Antichrist as the little horn. You say, well, what is little horn? What does that mean? Well, a horn refers to power and authority, but he's a, he's a little horn, okay? So he has a humble rise up above the other rulers of the world. Uh, many believe that he begins this period of uh, seven years 
He begins by confirming a Mideast peace treaty ensuring peace with Israel. That's a very common viewpoint. And in Revelation 6, 1, uh, that is when the first seal is open. That begins what is called Daniel's 70th week, or as people call it, the seven-year tribulation. Uh, so whatever peaceful rise, humble rise, uh, peaceful uh, acquiring of power doesn't last very long because we see that the second seal is world war. Revelation chapter 6, verse 3, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. So these horses seen here in this passage, we know them as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, the second seal is world war. The third seal is famine. The fourth seal is widespread death. So by the time the fifth seal is opened, if you look at all this and study all this, by the time of the fifth seal, uh, a quarter of the earth's population is killed. Now, who is to blame for this? Just stop and think about this. Who is to blame? Well, really, it's, it's the beast who is to blame, right? Who is responsible? Well, it's the Antichrist who is at war. That leads to famine. The warfare and the famine lead to death. But who do the people of the earth blame? They blame God. They blame God's people. You ever notice how someone will go out, they'll do something terrible, and instead of blaming the person who did it, they look to blame everybody else. And I can just hear people say when these things happen, what kind of God would allow this to happen? See, they're blaming God for what the Antichrist does. Now, the fifth seal uh, tells us of all the believers who were killed for their testimony and for their belief in the word of God. So obviously there is going to be believers on the earth during the tribulation. Jesus warns of these things in the Olivet Discourse of Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. He says that the sun and moon go dark before he returns. Okay, the sun and moon go dark. You've heard of the blood red moons, right? Well, that may be a little different, the ones you're uh, familiar with, the ones that we've heard of over the last few years. And there's always somebody coming out saying, oh, it's going to happen, you know, and they set this date or it's going to happen at this time period. And, and guess what? Never happens. I was telling some of you there were people predicting the uh, rapture on Easter. Rapture is going to happen this Easter because, and I'm not going to get into all of that, but there's always somebody predicting something. Guess what? They've all been wrong to this point. So we don't set dates, uh, obviously. That is a, a foolish, foolish thing to do. So the sun and moon go dark before the Lord returns. In the book of Joel, chapter 2, he also states this, that the sun and moon go dark, but he says that happens before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And that is exactly what we see in the sixth seal. So this is coming up upon the midpoint of the tribulation, the sixth seal. And that is when the Antichrist shows himself for who he really is, right? the agent of Satan. So the sun and moon go dark at the sixth seal. Joel says in Joel 2.31, you could make a note of that, Joel 2.31, that this happens before the day of the Lord. So that tells me that the day of the Lord is the great tribulation that it's one and the same thing. The final 42 months, the final three and a half years, which is marked by God's outpouring of wrath. This midpoint of the seven-year tribulation is marked by an event that we call the abomination of desolation. Actually, that's what Jesus called it in Matthew chapter 24. So turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 for a moment. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're coming to the end uh, of the message, but as you're turning there, let me just read what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15 through 21. Jesus said, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. 
And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. So those are the words of Jesus. They are trustworthy. Uh, so there is no doubt about it that the abomination of desolation, that marks the midpoint of the seven years. All right, And that midpoint, um, we see here, it is called the Great Tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. You're familiar with that term as well. Now, up until this point, up until the midpoint, the Antichrist has appeared that he's perhaps a man of peace. He's looking for peace. Uh, many believe that he is a friend to the Jewish people and they have been uh, apparently uh, been able to rebuild their temple. And now they finally have hopes of lasting peace. Uh, and you can just imagine this. What if somebody was able to bring peace to the Middle East? Wouldn't that capture the world's attention? If someone could do that, everyone would follow him, okay? And that's exactly, I think, what is going to happen. Now, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed. The son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So that passage really demonstrates that at the midpoint, the abomination of desolation, the Antichrist, he enters into the temple and he declares himself to be God. That's when the mask comes off. From this point on, he no longer pretends to be a man of peace. Instead, he turns into the world dictator, basically from hell. It's at this point, where many believe he will turn against Israel and the Jewish people, many of whom likely will have come to faith, or at least they will come to faith after this. This is going to open their eyes to things. And they will, many of them, I believe, come to faith through the ministry of what is called the two witnesses or the 144,000. We don't have time to get into those things. So before we close, there is one more figure one more figure that we need to mention, and that is the false prophet, the false prophet. Uh, basically, he acts as the third member of the satanic trinity. You know, the Holy Trinity has God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Well, the satanic trinity has the dragon, Satan, the beast, Antichrist, and then his false prophet. Some have described the false prophet as a satanic version of John the Baptist. Why? Because John the Baptist pointed people to Christ. Well, the false prophet will point people to the Antichrist. Revelation 13, 11 through 18, and I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. He spoke like a dragon. This is back in Revelation 13. Now, he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So if someone was able to do that, again, people will follow him. They'll be scared of him too. That's a, a powerful motivator for people. Either follow him, worship him, or die, basically, is the option that people are going to be given. Uh, verse 14, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand 
or on their foreheads that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, he says. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Now maybe there's one or two listening here this morning or later on uh, on the radio or online and they will hear this and they'll think to themselves, well, this is just a little too incredible to believe all of this. You know, it's a great story, but uh, not really so sure I believe in the, the beast and the Antichrist and, and all of these things that the Bible speaks of. Well, I would simply ask that person, because it is an amazing uh, story when you read it. I would simply ask that person, do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in Jesus? Because it's the same Bible that tells us about Jesus that tells us about the beast in these events. So what about Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet? What's the good news in all of this? What is their fate? Revelation 20, verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and there they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. My friends, this is more than just a story. It is Bible prophecy. God has told us these things will happen. The only question is when, and are you ready?